Good morning and welcome. This is Tevo Creative Leadership and I'm Tevo DRC and we are the host and also the lead pastor, founder, apostolic doctrine originator, if you want to go into that, of the DFW Leader Online Ministry Fellowship. I've been fellowship. I've been in uh, ministry all my life. I was born a pastor's firstborn child and they were not into legalism, so I never heard thou shalt not female or anything woman. It was just do whatever God says, and and by osmosis, you pick up the man as the head of the home, the married legally married husband. Even when the grandmothers came, both sides of the family, and his mother would stay a, a bit more strong-willed than everyone, you know, cared. But she was a loving person and giving, and she would take care of the children, keep the house in order by while the parents had church as well as worked in the school system, teachers. So they worked two jobs, their tent maker and their their church field, as they used to call it, the church field. It was way out in Doswell, Virginia, outside of Ashland, Virginia. And back then, I don't know what it's like now, it was a country church. And I can relate now, and also being in that area, the general area of the feel of what it is to be a rural pastor. I like to make... I know how pastors in that area are different places around the country talk and how they feel <laughs> different kinds from Pentecostal to Methodist Catholic. And I know how they talk. And so I'll, you know, I'll, I'll sort of wax a little bit more country or whatever. And I'll say, you know, they're Piney Woods preachers. I'm, I'm ministering, you know, about the Piney Woods preachers, but it's like I can. I'm respectful of them. I mean, it brings me joy, but the vernacular, I'm a word type person, a wordsmith. So when I hear accents or hear terminology that's sort of different from my own, I pick it up. But anyway, so my father was a Piney Wood preacher. So I was out there in the Piney Woods. They literally had pine trees around that church in Dazzle, the Baptist church. And when he died years later and we went for a memorial to the same church, we'd, you know, between that time and we'd left the area the city of Richmond, Virginia area, gone to the Norfolk Cosmopolitan Seaport, Virginia Beach, and and so forth. My father had become a supply pastor, not a senior pastor. So I really blossomed, really I blossomed when I get in a metropolitan area because I'm really a big thinker, and I try to enjoy the different kinds of diverse people groups, but I I just think big. So then we went back, and I remember that when I used to go to that church, there used to be an oil painting behind the pulpit, and as the pastor's child, I would sit there on the second or third pew. Mom didn't like to be the focus of attention, so we never sat on the front pew. So maybe that's why I like sitting. I don't care where I sit. I'm not into having to be shown off or anything. (laughs) I'll just sit where the Lord leads me and be comfortable. But when we went back for the memorial, the service, there was the same oil painting behind the pulpit. And there was the same white spot of paint that had been there 30 years so, you know, things are traditional and things uh, are are pleasant, but things can also be stuck in a rut. I'm not saying they are, but I'm just saying in life, we have to make sure we're really in a transition or hearing God. So we really do move to the next page. And I find that I have had to been in complete, utter DFW quagmire of religious and all this stuff out here, caustic religion is, and no relationship in, in most much of the area, if not the denominationals, basically, I've never seen it anywhere in the country. And I have traveled in ministry and been sent out by the Lord to many pockets of Christians in a professional strength way. I've never I've never seen anything like it where you can find great people, maybe at the top, very tough of big ministries We're not talking about them. I'm talking about the fruit that remains, if there is any, whenever there is any in certain parts of the followers of many of these who are trying trying to trade on their coattails. And that happened in the other parts of the United States because people don't have daddies. A lot of people don't have responsible, decent daddies or mamas that raise them right or have a good role model. So there's a hungry heart. For a lot of the preachers that were raised pretty raw and maybe more country or not as well, you know, deeply educated, which is not their fault, not their responsibility. But they have to know that if they have that big a gifting, which many of them really do have a big call, that they need to work on adjusting to emotional security, 
found only in Jesus. One of the things that I didn't know this would be a big deal because even though I was raised not raw, I was raised respected, cherished. I still had a big inferiority. I still fight it some days, not like I used to, but my identity was just, I didn't know who I was for years. And finally, the Lord had to take me through a time where out of the blue, he revealed that Jesus, who died on the cross for my sins, my well-being, my eternal salvation, needs to be the center of my esteem, center of me. If I'm So I'm not moved by you or your persona or anything to do with life. And that is a faith principle. I didn't realize it. It based back when I was a young mother and I would, I don't know, I was isolated. But when I got out, I felt inferior because I wasn't able to make good small talk. You know, it started in high school. I was shy, a wallflower. But, you know, everybody's got their deal to learn and grow no matter what. And so when I would go out, I thought, man, I wish I could be more upwardly mobile back then in the 80s. You know, that was when all the commercialism started in the Christian community, as well as the nation of uh, the Western, the uh, United States, all that Madison Square Avenue and everything started coming out. And so there's this, you know, readjustment and I wasn't involved in materialism in my life, basically, I don't think, hopefully not. But that was part of being the turf of newlywed or young mother, you know, you're keeping up with the, what you'd think is the right thing for the child to grow them from the roots upward. And then you got the pressure of business and, you know, just the minefields of life and TV and all that. I think anyway, but it wasn't that, it wasn't the worst thing going on in my life. I had a, I love my husband and I love my family and, but I'm, I'm a perfectionist unless God gets a hold of me. And that was my nightmare. That was what he was really wanting. I would feel, oh, I, I'm not perfect. I felt angry. I felt, I didn't do anything with the anger. I just felt angry. I was just not perfect. I'd made a mistake or I did something I flubbed up and I would spend days beating myself down. And the Lord wanted me to get that way so he could deal with me. And he said, Tavo, years ago, he said, Tavo, you can forgive anybody, anything, anywhere, no matter what. I said, yes. He said, but there's one thing you can't forgive you. And I went, whoa, you are right. So since that time, when I make my list for everyone to make sure I don't have any bitter resentment or grudges or anybody through the years, I will just go and say, Lord, and I ask you to, you know, if, if I'm, if the hindrance is not my unforgiveness toward other people, and that's not the sin. Well, am I not forgiving me? And that's a huge deal to know. So back in the same era of that timing, the Lord was really, because I was being stuck in the house, you know, with the child. And so I was getting close to the Lord. He used that. And I would, he would say, I found a verse about competition and it changed my life and my esteem. It was like, Jesus is the source of my esteem, not my money, not my house, not my ministry, not my fan clubs, which I don't have any. But in other words, not my car, not my status or my race or anything. It's just like, oh, you're the source You because I'm Jesus's child. He loves me. That was so liberating. It still is because when people get into all this competition, now there's, I was reading on the article and the other day on the paper, New York Times, and it said that seven, 70% of teenagers are hooked on into Instagram and they, that Instagram knowingly programs FOMO, F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. And see, that's the new term for peer pressure. That's the new term for envy. That's the new term that I was facing back then, keeping up with the Joneses. And in in life, you can also see there's also, as a minister, preacher, or whatever, that you can see there is a temptation because of media and the way things are set up, that you could also feel driven to perform, driven to achieve, that you're a failure if you don't look good, the part. And that is keeping up with the ministry Joneses in the Christian you born again community. You know, that is everybody's, you know, this is just things that are interference with relationships. God loves you. I love you. But when we're looking at what makes people turned off and not want to go, why is there the falling away? I think it's more like the driving away, running away from legalism and hoopla and hoop jumping performance. Then what is it with the real Christ, if he were appearing today in the modern day with TVs and everything. Well, he could appear. I think I wrote this article. 
in 2014 or 17, I don't remember, it's called Jesus on the Third Row, that Jesus, oh no, Jesus uh, Jesus came to town, that's a different one, on TavoLeader.org, TavoLeader.com, it said, what if Jesus came to town, and I'm not, it was a poem, but I can't recite the poem, what if Jesus came to town and he came and got off at the bus station carrying a cardboard suitcase? And he didn't look the part. He didn't have on a business suit. He didn't have his CD ready to hand out or his book or his professional business card. He just got off and started walking up the streets of Dallas. I use Dallas as an illustration because it's urban and it's city and it's uh, that kind of reality. And what if he got off and he wasn't white? He was dark skinned with olive skin, sort of long hair and olive skin. Maybe they thought he was Hispanic. But he wasn't, he had no entourage. He had no people serving him. And he was just the Messiah, the apostle of the United States and the whole global Christ falling community. But he just got off unannounced to see what would happen if people would, how they would react if he just showed up like that. No fanfare, no announcements, no red carpet. Because I'd been noticing (laughs) disrespect, I'd been noticing caustic. You must be born again, TV affected, Christ following what goes on under that name of Christ following in ministry at the grassroots. When you're not famous, you'll find out. Listen, maybe that's why as a leader, I lost board members, mother, I lost family. I had a divorce. I wasn't counting on it all. I lost people that spoke into my life. They died. They got old. They got sick. I lost people. And then I wasn't famous and floundering to find my way, my bearings in this giant metroplex. The confusion, the huge amount of just geography alone and people groups, and then what is my niche here? And so then I realized that even after a while, it was really hard, just really hard. The isolation, people weren't friendly. They were always busy, only busy, even Christian, really busy, achieving and achieving. And I thought, wow, Lord, and I'd been in, a, like I said, a lower, sort of a low key compared to this city plus a lot of rural in ministry and in family. And that was fine with me. But I didn't know that when we come to, let's say, the buckle in the Bible belt, the Mecca of all ministry, this area, DFW, that you would find what we saw and and what we found in, we believe just the lack of relationship theology, achieving and bless me versus priority of relationship, fear of the Lord with God himself first, first love lampstand lifestyle in ministry, and then down no law that interferes with relationships, accuses, causes one to work, do works mentality, and turns the heart's cold into the Eli Temple High Priesthood of 1 Samuel, which I've taught on using formulas which accuse out of busyness, well-intentioned, but still formulas and accusations in ministry. So that's part of my thing. But then you realize that you're not famous in this kind of crowd, big crowds. I mean, big crowds and then little ones who model the big ones wanting to be big and they're not big yet may never be with the attitude and the... um and the lack of relationship, skill, or priority. I don't know what it is. Maybe you just don't know any better, and we forgive them. Yeah, we need to forgive, but we need to really pray for that. It's just a a representation of Jesus Christ that's not fully accurate and fair to his name. So we thought, if I see it three times or more, I teach on it. So I thought, what is in the doctrinal bath waters? And I I said, there for the grace of God go I. I was raised in a emotionally healthy home. I was raised in a Baptist home. I was raised not with tongue talkers. I was raised with a holy fear of the Lord home. I was raised in a home where the father was the head of the household, but he, he treated the women like equals, not back under the chattel, woman-owning law, degrading law in the New Testament sense. So it caused me to be that noble Berean, which I now speak before the law, relationships existed. Sin is the only reason the law came to calm people in society and keep relationships guarded, guided, and governed so it wouldn't kill each other in God's plan. Throughout the 
good part of the law, the Mosaic Ten Commandments, all the priesthood, Aaronic priesthoods, Zerubbabel priesthood, all the different ones, the coming Messiah foretold, and then the vine of history. We find idolatry in the priesthood, in the people of God, and the prophets were brought on the scene. They had asked God, the people of God, the Hebrews, had asked God in the Old Testament for a king. They wanted to be, so this is it, FOMO, fear of missing out, people-pleasing, not God-pleasing, but thinking of themselves, and oh, we want to look as good keeping up with the Joneses, the Hebrew Joneses, because they said to, to God and cried out, Lord, we want a king to Moses. We want a king. And the king, and the Lord gave them the king, and it turned out to be King Saul, oppressed and immature, emotionally infantile, really looking good, really looking the part, taller than everybody, but really a wuss. And he ended up getting killed because he consulted the wrong power source, the supernatural power, when he knew the law, he knew the Mosaic Ten Commandments, and he knew the right thing, but he was needing a crutch, and he went the wrong way, and he went to the witches of Endor. And the Bible teaches around that time in Samuel and around the time in Kings, it says that rebellion, any rebellion, is as the sin of witchcraft. When we get into the witch-watching groups of Charismatica, Crazymatica, where they have their well-intentioned doctrine, but they're always spooky, uh, making all the people see Jezebels and controllers when really the Levitical patriarchism is a controlling personality of that of that movement, and whelp Western European Levitical patriarchism, patriarchism uh, that is a really a Jezebel spirit, ironically that sees Jezebels and keeps women under control, patriarchal society, and then the women are like the matriarchs that are there, and they don't usually have many that are black on the stage or women. So that's a whole other topic. I have an audio book on TavoLeader.org and on on the YouTube Tavo, let's see, YouTube.com Tavo Creative Leadership. Because I want people to know I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not mad at all these people, all these apostles, false apostles. we got to know what's true for Jesus' sake. I'm upset like Jesus tossing over a few temple money changers. Like Jesus said, the zeal for his father's house, I have it for the houses. And I ask you to pick apart this doctrine. Like Paul said, a noble Berean should, and he commended the noble Bereans for picking apart his doctrine. So I can pick apart their doctrine. You can pick apart mine. We all do it with James. With an agreement, we respect one another, no matter how difficult it is to stand that doctrine. So the idea is if I look strong, it's because I've had to be, and I've given God's given me his power and might, which is part of the seven spirits you could look up, and you need to if you're a Christian in the whelp community uh, of Luke, excuse me, Isaiah 11, 2 and 3, about Jesus the Messiah. He had the spirit of power and might. His father's spirits fully dunamis filled, yet relationship respectful and friendly and, and ready. He was a prophet's prophet, the Messiah, the apostle's apostle in every gate of every city. And he had God's spirit of power, might, spirit of the Lord. He had the spirit of counsel, wisdom, the fear of the Lord. And yet it said with all that huge supernatural power inside his Middle Eastern earth suit, his package, he was sent in on purpose to try God's heart, God's people and the people of the world's hearts and minds from every nation, men and women. Well, then he was, it says also in the next verse, that this Messiah, this prophet, this amazing person would be, would not, he would delight himself in the fear of the Lord. He'd be quick of understanding with all that power and might and insight, wisdom. Yet he would not judge, accuse or judge by the sight of his eyes. And he would not base decisions based on what he heard. He wouldn't sin spy and accuse and look by type judging and stereotyping have racism and bias that wasn't in his heart also he could perceive or seriously perceive the motives the intentions of people's hearts but he wasn't a voyeur or he didn't abuse that gift by being an accuser judge a pharisee he also would not believe the evil report 
or accept gossip or tolerate it in the ministry. He cherished people. All those things, Mosaic Ten Commandments, the Levitical Law, Jesus not judging and accusing and delighting himself in the fear of the Lord. Every one of those has a relationship quality and factor either with God, oneself, other people, and or society and family and business keeping in a peaceful, calm realm so it can continue on and operate, not hurt anybody. So we're sort of looking at, we like the joy of, oh yes, bless me God. And we love to have God answer our prayers. We love miracles. We like success. We like all those good things, but not at the cost of a pure heart, not at the cost of losing our first love to do good works. We don't want to turn out like the church of Ephesus with that wonderful, amazing and complex, amazing book about family, spiritual warfare, you name it, the whole armor, seated in heavenly places, unity, body unity, church of Ephesians chapter four, all those things common doctrine are in there. But even though they worked hard and they loved the Lord for many years, something happened in their midst. And that is the first church. The Holy Spirit writes a letter to in Revelation chapter two, verses one through seven, the church of Ephesus that has a rebuke for that land stand for losing their first love, their pure heart. Instead, they were challenged by so many directions, so many people, the Temple Diana, all the different occult, everything that went on, the Roman government, all the the Gentiles and Jews in that Asia Minor area, the pressure and warfare immense on relationships. But the worst relationship of all, they lost the sight, the insight of the preserving, sustaining, stabilizing, mature quality of ministry relationship with the Most High God with Jesus Christ, their Savior, they lost it and instead got too busy and raced from one appointment to the other and got more disappointed and frustrated, but they didn't get it because they were so interested in doing what was right, helping God, helping people, the challenges of the day of Satan, you know, and all false beliefs, but instead God zeroed right in in Revelation 2 and says, you know what? You have a lot of good deeds you've done. You've taken a good stand of being bold and courageous. I know that, but I miss you. I I really want you to be with me because you're not getting fresh revelation. You're not taking time off. Your relationships are suffering with your wife and your poor me attitude. You're a victim like Eli, the temple priesthood. Poor me. It's her fault. There's one more woman. I've seen too many like that alone by herself. No man. And there she is over there, probably some victim, some, you know, crying, overly emotional woman on the steps. I've seen it all and I'm tired today and I don't feel like it. So, you know, and that's the Eli Temple High Priesthood that does that. That is the standard for lack, for for no quality in leadership. You're jaded and cynical, raw. You need time off to be alone without ministry, without help without mama or daddy, but be yourself with God and humble yourself and take time off just to perceive and discern the mind and will and the way of the Lord with your Bible. So we suppose that the good intention, the good deed doers of the church of Ephesus, the Ephesians book of Ephesians had seen it all done it all. And they'd had all this accomplishment, but yet they missed it because God has one word for them. It's very, very sober. I'm going to say it sober. He says, unless you change and get it right, you're ma-. he says, I'm going to remove your lampstand. Why would he say something so unpolitically correct, so unfair, so blaming? You know, that's how they think today, right now, frankly. Why would he bring down the judgment, not accuser judgment, but the judgment of eternal God? Why would he say that so strongly to the well-intentioned hard workers after they suffered got their PhD more than once, pretty hard days, and went through all sorts of hell and high water to try to make Jesus' name great. Why? Because they got set in their ways. Why? Because they got compassion fatigued and empathy free. That is the Eli priesthood that I met, that I teach on it now from that point of view of trying to be, trying to find a place where I could get, you know, have fellowship for my ministry, the Christian community I needed. 
Uh, I found out that when you've, you're grieving, like the lone woman, you don't have a man beside you, you're not famous in some of, a lot of the temples, too many, that you are either by the people that are whelp, that the community is isolates you, that, that there isn't a, I don't know, there's suspicion repeated, there's this threatening, if you're, you know, there's this patricianism to wade through aristocracy. There's the Levitical law, woman, thou art bound, you are not allowed. This is not African-American, mind you, or Baptist. They're respectful, very respect, even shockingly respectful. Methodists as well, Catholics, more denominationals, and more people who are more filled with God's might and power. And that's a sign right there. So you go in and you are under the, you know, you've just been through hell and you're in a grief state and you have the power of God, the power of might. I know I have God's power and might on him. I've needed it. It was God's mercy. I know about the Holy Spirit, but I'm very quiet and a timid person, basically. And I know the book of Acts, but I don't have to be bossy with it. I'm not. I'm James 317. I teach James 7, 3, 317 for this reason that people were assessing, well, they were accusing based on gender, look, and style or power or not power, they were judging like a stereotype, the Jezebel, because they taught their head was enthroning. That's my term, and I've written on that. Enthroning Jezebel in some of these Christian movements, born-again movements. When they've done that, that's where whelp is, Levitical, back under the law, patriarchism and matriarchism. Not sweet. (laughs) If you are not their kind, if you're not whelp, and you're not a... A matriarch. I'm a maven, maybe, but not a matriarch. And I was raised free, and I think that must be in my spirit. They see that, but they don't know what they like. They don't like it. The spirit on them, not them personally, but they just, that grieves them because they are controlling. It's a controlling spirit. Shepherding is what it is. So we live and learn, but we have to teach doctrine now because we don't want anyone to not be able to go to Jesus' houses, even this kind. And walk in the door as a new Christian, a new baby Christian, a believer from another faith, and then want to try Jesus, and they get accosted with a, a deaf, dumb, and blind spirit of accusation, prophetic, or whatever it is, charismatic, whelp, fear, people, ple- whatever this is, it's unfriendly, and it says, we're better, or you don't fit our type, and then demands to be over you. That was the other part. I was not brought up around that, where everybody's got to know who you're under and over. That's why I'm teaching on it so boldly. I thought it because it's so, to a Baptist, a Christian who's not into the formal hierarchy and the Levitical governing system, which is really passe, we're based by the Spirit now, but people who want to delve into the religious roots of Jesus, bring it out. I think they do it out of love, but they do it wrong if they are controlling and accusing with it. You can do all you want to, in my point. You can be as messianic, or I'm not saying these are messianic either because they're not all like that. But I'm saying you can be as patriarchal and matriarchal as you want to be unless you accuse people that are newbies, strangers, by gender, by race. All right. That's a relationship theology big Big teaching right there. If you want to see how Jesus acted in ministry, was he a whelp? Was he a Middle Eastern whelp? All right. Levitical patriarch? No. Why? Because he, his relationships were clean, pure-hearted, not controlling, not dulled down. And he even confronted the par- the Pharisees face to face. He didn't just gossip about them. That's another sign of Phariseeism. Whelp and Phariseeism are hand in hand. That's what I experienced on many states. All right, so we go back for discernment. What is really good about Jesus' houses? Well, you can go in there and get it with the Holy Spirit. You can learn about. But then you have to live, you know, abide and go back and back again. And then you'll find out what the doctrine is about covering and the law and legalism. So what we want to do is point out that when Jesus instituted the church, how could you tell if he was back under the law of Pharisee or not? Well, he wasn't a Pharisee. We just know that. But when we look at his relationships, which I have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when he was alive on the earth in ministry and in personal life with Mother Mary, 
and with fallen sinners and people accused of adultery, little kids, you just, all you have to do, this is relation, abiding in James 3.17 relationship theology, which is my version of this, our name for it. And all you have to do is read Jesus in every relationship, how he acted and reacted, even under pressure with men, women, fallen people, the chosen people, his own people, people who didn't want to, you know, all races, little kids, and then just act like Jesus. Ta-da! That is it. Only. So I don't have to know every bit of your theology. I'm going to work on mine. And I will say that the only reason I have spoken out because of the caustic relationships of this area in general. That's why I go, that's why I form, I talk about at least, I go fellowship with churches when I can, you know, when I'm sent, but I'm starting, our, you know, what our own is, we have our own church, online fellowship, and it's going to have land with men's, men and women, other people delegated to if the Lord tarries. But the idea is I'm for the fellowship with the saints with qualifications, because now you got to for the sake of the people that go, the Christians. <laughs> And I'm teaching only to the Christian community when I say this. Everybody else can listen, but hey, I'm not talking to you about it. We want you to feel respected if you're not a Christian when you go visit some of these places. At one point in my early journey out here, I would say, man, if I am accepted maybe in the Baptists, in the Methodists without question, not gender, gender profiling, racial profiling to me, chauvinism, I thought, wow, and each of those churches were diverse, the Baptists and the Methodists, when I would go, different ones. I thought, man, I'm soft-spoken, but I'm treated and disrespected like I, they've seen a Jezebel. This is white whelp. So I'd go in there and make my best because I love Holy Spirit. They've got it market. They they corner the market on that, so you can't get but so much good worship in the you know unless you go. Now they have new branches. Listen, in the last two years... God has broken through and their non whelp worship. I go there now. And I, as a minister, as a, I'm not a people pleaser. And I believe that if I'm a minister, I should be able to go to somewhere in the Christian community, black or white, big or small church, when the Lord leads me, if I need a break and just enjoy being someone else's ministry, have them minister to me. Take off. That's why Jesus, I said, was in the one of my articles was Jesus went and took off and sat in the back row of this church. And he was so filled with power and might and the Holy Spirit and his eyes, you know, were like a fire <laughs> that he was sitting in the back, just taking off, trying to veg out and hear God from his father. When the people at front, they had all this theology about spying spooky devils on people. And he, they were shocked. They sent the witch watchers after Jesus in the back row to see what he was doing there. I had that happen to me. That's why I thought of it like that. They just couldn't take anybody that had more power than them. <laughs> they were legalistic. <laughs> years ago, many years ago, the Lord said, Tavo, don't take these things personally. I went, oh, really? <laughs> He said, take them prophetically. You're seeing what I see. Therefore, if I think I see something three times or more, I'm to teach on it. This is far more than three times. Listen, in more states as well. If I had a good daddy, like I think of my daddy all the time doing these podcasts because I think he was so the opposite. He was so non-controlling. He respected my mother, respected me, his mother, all the women, all the races. He was just a down-to-earth person. He never was like this. So it made me heightened when I think, you mean people are really tolerating this? They're not being noble Bereans and they're putting up with a Christian caustic being called a Jezebel every week or woman thou art bound. You better be quiet. Only the men lead. That's out here. And it's in other places in the deep South, believe me. But there's so many good qualities. You want to go to some of these places and they, can you stand being jumped? If you look up my Tavo Ministry Lexicon, I think it's that, Google that, dot wordpress dot com, the Lexicon Tavo Ministries Lexicon dot wordpress dot com, you can see a lot of definitions that came from my discoveries and, dis and my doctrinal theology surprises in the last 30 years, and one of them is berate without relate. That's a whole topic, being jumped and called. In a public setting, you're jumped you're you're accused for not being under authority, their kind in a whelp church, and you're 
told that you are in rebellion, but they've never spoken to you calmly in a Matthew 18, 15 relationship, respectful form, Matthew 18, 15 through 17, or, and or Galatians 6, 1. I know my theology on this. Authority theology is our turf. The other part is the these people, bless their little hearts, ministry hearts, they don't know Ephesians common doctrine, freedom, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God the Father, they have omitted, they've forgotten or just never knew. Ephesians 5.21, mutual submission in the fear of the Lord, everyone including household mates. They don't know that um, Ephesians 4, one through 3 also says how everyone is supposed to walk in meekness and lowliness and long suffering with the other relationships in the body. They don't happen to know that the fivefold offices are written not in capital A apostle, capital P prophet, which means celebrity or elevated ministry, elite ministry, entitled ministry. Instead, they're lowercase letters like Paul always writes, even about himself, lowercase a apostle, B lowercase, so that it's humble servant humility with different anointing, of course, and power and strength and God's call experience. So we've done our, our research because we were like confused. What is being taught when you go from, you shift from one part of the body to the other, we're supposed to be a community and get along, work out our own salvation. So then I happened to thank God I felt like it's always, you know, like when I got jumped by whelps and when I tried visiting whelp churches and they wouldn't speak to me, I was in line and, and they knew I was a nice person, I thought. And so I had not joined there. And I, the group around that area, this certain area, I think believe there's one apostle over everybody. And these people, I felt that I, you know, these people, I feel like it was implied that I needed to be under that apostle because I'm a prophetic person and a female. And I know my theology. I know my doctrine and that is false teaching. And I know the groups that hang around with this kind of group. As I mentioned a couple of times already, there was a book in the nineties written by a famous apostle teach apostolic teacher professor that said in ministry that there are certain apostles that God places in the gates of the city over all the other ministers. And I was around that in my former state and I heard it said, that's why I know about it. And that those people who took it were small ministers, very small. And they put themselves together in a band of like a handful. And they started to MYOB, mind other people's business and keep track of who was not and was on that list because I never, they never talked to me or called me up to confront me. I had my cell phone and my regular phone. Nobody called me. And many people I would count, God, you know, because I was around the area, used around the area, the community is my turf, the Christian community. And so I knew people who really liked me and knew I was fine. And then I had a lot of people that were board members and spiritual advisors and pastors and people with black and white. So I knew that I was fine. My husband said, fine. Nobody questioned me or my call or my life under authority. Being being born again was that kind of group, the whelp and that theology that they were over everybody else, including me, though they, I was, and here's the thing that is out here big. I think it's too big. I think it's still out here. It's like a man out in the grassroots whelp, usually patrician aristocracy mixed in, will automatically view that every man, and and I've met people recently, a nice new acquaintance family, and what I feel is when I show up, the man that that group has been in, because I know where they've, they've been around patrician, I know, I know where they used to go. They're not in that group now, but it rubbed off because there is this implication that the man is over me. And they're really nice people, but it's difficult because I've been around that controlling spirit. My father, that is not an apostolic thing. That is a personal traditional belief that every woman, let me say it this way. If I'm not married to you, you're not over me. 
If not, I, if I haven't signed on to mem- be a member of your church, then you're not over me. I'm not under you. If I am not in your pastor ministry group, then I am not. You're not over me. And the pastors groups I deal with, they don't talk like that anyway. I, and let me mention why. During my doctrinal growth, I found God's mercy, Galatians 1, 1 and 2, which is Ap- Apostle Paul, his own form of spiritual authority. Let me teach it. If you look at what Paul says, it's in line with the first church, which was house to house. There was no such thing in Jesus's relationships in ministry or the disciples that I read of in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not even in Paul's two thirds of the New Testament that says it is a sin to visit more than one church. And neither did they set up people to watch out for church hoppers because it was house to house. Neither did they fear females or anybody with a demon because no one set up a theology of watch out for the Jezebel, accuse people in absence behind their back and spread rumors that is totally foreign to the nature of Jesus Christ, especially even back in the Messiah prophecy of Isaiah 11, 2 and 3. He would not judge by the sight of his eyes nor make decisions based on what he heard. He wasn't a prophet. Jesus wasn't a prophet who would sit over there and surmise and guess and get vibes and prophetic shakings that a person in the congregation or a new person or somebody across town was a witch, a charismatic witch, a crazy medic witch or a Jezebel. That is called spectral evidence. I mention it often. It's that thick in America. Spectral, it's so presumption and arrogance and entitled because no one speaks to the person. They try them in absentia absentia and they spread rumors and blackball them and put a black mark on their reputation, which happened to many people where I used to live and to myself. Then they'll say, well, you know, they just got hard feelings and they've made, you know, they have unforgiveness baggage. (laughs) Oh, you're forgiven. Totally. It's just that it's a teaching point because I'm strong. This has made me strong and made me know how bad it is when you're locked into an isolated region that's not metropolitan or your reputation and ministry is ruined because of gossip, backbiting, and Phariseeism, neo-Phariseeism, accusation, not assessing, but accusing. It's a relationship, huge deal. Many times, that's why many people do not go to church. That's why I'm on a vacation from church and I go to the barista fellowships as a symbol, prophetic sign to those kind of people right now. And I'm joined by many others of all colors with me. I and the brothers and sisters that are with me because at least you get respect. And I do fellowship selectively and I do go and I love the churches I'm finding now that are not back to the law that know the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So God is moving. Praise God. So let's go to Paul. Here we have the first church. Nobody's entitled. They're humble. They're fasting, praying, seeking God. The first church apostles are so busy trying to hear God. It's so tough because there's no Bible pre-existing theology or generation of pastors to ask questions of, bounce things, theories off of, and what they're hearing God. No experience. They're doing it solo. Jesus has gone to heaven. So there they are, humble and they are working it out, their daily salvation and their daily bread. So we don't find any traditions of men yet, except the Jewish tradition, the Gentile traditions that they have to uncover and deal with. But instead, they're house to house church. So there's no Phariseeism in the new believers, maybe on the you know old belief, the Pharisee system there is. So they're trying to work out their own salvation, fellowship. They're all excited. Acts 2 happens, but there's no fault finding of, oh, yes, I saw my sheep over at your church, or I heard they were church hoppers. That is, that's an accuser. That's an accusation. It belongs not in our midst. And it, it is if you feel that strongly, it's your business. Go confront them in Galatians 6, 1, humility. But don't be a busybody and don't accuse them. Assess them and say, well, why are they church hopping? Maybe there's a stronger ministry over there and they their husband only wants weak at your place. And, and the lady needs more power to get the Holy Spirit 
that talks in tongues and the husband won't go there. That's about, I've, I've been through that. So if we have one body, if we think one body in a team, then there's no threat. I believe, to me, frankly, the Pharisee systems, when you do get into all that struggle with legalism and overseer watching everybody and making sure they're only in one church, theirs, it's about money. It's mammon. It's a mammon. Oh, the tithes might leave. I'm the opposite. I'm thinking, I'm not dependent upon you for your money. God has sent me for years ago. I believe that I need prayer to get to the money that will take me to where he wants me. But the idea is that I believe that if you are a member of the body of Christ and you should pay your tithes, Malachi 3, the tent, whole tithe to the Lord, not legalistically because you want to, he does protect you. But you, it says, give it to the storehouse. Well, I believe you need to go and say, where are my storehouses, Holy Spirit? You might have two of them, and you give them, give your tithe to the storehouses, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise, no matter if your storehouse is one place or another, or if you feel that one, you know, if your conscience says only one storehouse, that's where you go to church, that's fine, but I'm not going to be looking for you to be my source or my funding. The Lord is, but we do need prayer, and we, of course, if we're your storehouse, give part, at least something, you know, as the Lord leads. Um. So let's go back to Paul. Paul had been ostracized for 13 years by the first 12 disciples who were mentored by Jesus. They just didn't trust him. So he went up and got tons, the abundance of revelations that made him famous up in the Damascus, Syria area, where he's isolated with God and who knows what spiritual warfare. And he comes back down so full of might and power, and free from the law that he writes two-thirds of the New Testament. However, he has issues with some of the leaders of some of these churches that are still legalistic. One of them is the Church of Galatia. So when Paul writes about freedom, when you put on Christ, there is no male or female, black or white, bond or free, then he has evidently, this is my opinion, after knowing life in the Pharisee realms for many years, doctrine, Paul starts his book, his letter to the Galatians, by immediately coming up with his own spiritual authority, approving that he really has valid spiritual authority. These people he rebukes later for being under witchcraft, and we know that it was the law that they were, somebody said, who, in verse chapter 3, who bewitched you, Galatians, to put you back under the law when Jesus Christ has set you free? Well, evidently they're their control or their desire to know about Paul, if he was a valid authority, made him defend himself by writing Galatians 1 and 2, and it says, I'm Paul, an apostle. He called himself an apostle, used the lowercase letter, servant. I, I'm the Paul, the apostle, sent out by God, not by any one man or any one group. I and the brothers that are with me. Now, I'm going to point out he was not sent out by a famous TV preacher or a preacher or a male or female. He was not sent out by the local established churches, the local established 12 apostles who were mentored by Jesus, not under them. He was sent out by God, commissioned by God, and not his theology was downloaded from the Lord, yet he was he, he co-labored with them. He's respectful of them and taught with them finally after they allowed him. However, when you look at the way he writes it, to me, he says, I, Paul, sent out by the Lord, not by any one group, any one man, but I and the brothers that are with me. Paul didn't say, I and the brothers that are under me. Paul doesn't use terminology of over and under. So I've written about who is Paul over, who is Paul under. Paul was not under anybody. He was he was in league, a co-laborer, working alongside as a teammate to the other apostles and the churches. And then there is a chain of command. There is a discipline. If people are out of order, they're polluting the doctrine. And we can see what happens if there is someone false teaching and dominating. That is over there in Church of Thyatira, Revelation 3, where it talks about to the overseer of the Church of Thyatira, why do you tolerate it happened to be a man back then because they hadn't worked that way. You know, the legalism was pretty strong and they were coming out of the patriarchal society. They haven't had 2,000 years of, 
you know, all this stuff going on, theological discovery and revelation and coming to America, but whatever. <laughs> so we see the uh, theology was to address to the head leader, which was a male, the apostle gatekeeper of that church overseer. And they said, why do you tolerate that Jezebel, which happened to be a woman teacher, teaching false doctrine, fornication, eating food offered to idols, which is a no-no. So they jump past the law and say, like Rod Parsley said when Deborah was mentioned, and she was married to Lapidoth, who is not in her national judging ministry, not a prophet like Deborah. He said that God will look around, and this is Rod Parsley in his Reformation Bible, I read years ago, and he said, when God looks around a nation and he can't find enough strong men, he'll call women. And so that sounds good to me. I'll go with that. So in the Old Testament, that was Deborah. In the New Testament, we have the legendary Jezebel. That's confusing. So I studied Jezebel and witches after all this witch watching and sighting Jezebels with spectral evidence in churches, legalistic churches. And I found out that, you know what, if Paul had written to the day where he said, don't, you know, let's say Paul said, don't let the women be silent in church. Look what Paul had to deal with in a short time. No pre-existing generation of ministers, TV preachers, YouTube, Bible theologians. They were making it up as the Lord allowed them on the spot. It was great pressure. Paul had to get the church and the other, of course, other disciples. And Jesus had to set the church up fast before they died. They only had so much time. So Paul had to pick his battles. And right then, the women had been held back and oppressed, repressed in the Hebrew community. Community, they were under the law. In the Gentile community, they were free-ranged, full of demons. Before they got there, they had to be cleaned up, but they were unschooled. And so he had problems with the women. The real women were shouting out because they were uneducated, never been, you know, some maybe were Gentiles and not under the law. They just had no discipline or formal training. So Paul had to quickly just solve that. So he said, women, be quiet in the church and let your husbands teach you at home. Now they had to grow up with that and get mellowed out through the years, but now there's no legalism. And if you don't feel it's right, don't do it. But if you do feel it's freedom in Christ to be a female leader or, or whatever apostle, like I am, whatever you just do what God says, if you're married now, see, this is it. I grew up free. I didn't have all this legalism criticizing me from my father. He wasn't like a jail keeper. He was like a freedom. Whatever God says, do it. And he and my mother were like that. I got. A, I grew up. I was wed. I had two children. And that freedom there, uh, the background was no church at all and no legalism. Thank God. And that was wonderful. He just said, whatever God says to you, go do it. And I always put the family first, the ministry second. So now that I'm not married, now that I'm not wed, which was shocking to me, but I'm on the worst list of Phariseeism greatest sins. Now I'm on the legalistic hit list, a divorced person. But you know what? I've gotten so I don't care, and I'm under the, not under the law, and I've got freedom in Christ. My children turned out very well, highly functional, capable grown-ups. Uh, I don't have any issues with the fornication issue. I have a clean track record in ministry, and I also have a lot of proof that I have been circumspect even after the not being wed anymore. I purposely have not dated or wanted to date because I didn't know who I'd trust out here in the name of Christianity. Why would I want to? So right now I'm free. And until I am remarried, till God sends me only the right human person to be legally wed with, which I look forward to, and I got to quit. I will be under that I'll be chain of command, not controlled, not under the law, but I'll be gladly Ephesians five twenty one mutually submitted in the fear of the Lord in the home, and also mutually I'll be submitted in chapter twenty two. I mean Ephesians five twenty two submit to the husband because it won't be a problem. I'm gonna, you know what I mean. I've studied this, and my time has run out. That's why I'm talking in jumbles. But God loves you. He forgives not under the law. Go for it, and bless you. This is Tavo D'Arcy signing off for now.
God bless. Support our podcast if you would, if the Lord allows and leads you. Thanks. Bye-bye.